Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we bless you as it has come to this time of preaching. I ask that you please bless my mind, my heart, my spirit, and my voice, that all that I say may be of you, that your word may go forth, and that someone may know more about the goodness of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I didn't feel too great when I walked in this morning, Apostle, but that song did something for oh, me. Don't say nothing, Pastor. You turn me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Open up your Bibles, turn your Bibles on. We're going to the book of Joshua chapter, actually we're going to the book of Numbers, excuse me, chapter 14. Numbers 14. And we're going to read verses 20 through 25. Numbers 14, verses 20 through 25. If you have it, say amen. If you need more time, say hold up. All right. Numbers 14, 20 through 25 reads, The Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and follows me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went, into, he went to and his descendants will inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are living in the valleys, turn back tomorrow and set out toward the desert along the route to the Red Sea. May our minds and spirits be blessed by the reading of his word. I wanna to talk to you this morning from the theme, come on with the come on, come on with the come on. Last Sunday, I talked about Caleb in his old age, 85 years old, telling his military leader, hey, listen, send me out to the outskirts. I need to go get this land that God promised I was supposed to get. I'm still fit enough. I still have as much energy as I had 40-something years ago. I can still do this. And we went through the different things that he did in that moment, and we kind of looked at his life. But I figured on this Sunday, especially with everything that's going on, we need to back up. Because that sermon said, I still got it. But the question is, what did he still have? Last Sunday, as I said, we looked at 85, asking for permission, letting people know, don't let the old age fool you. I'm going to go get what God has for me. But this Sunday, let's look at a deeper level of why God promised Caleb that stuff in the first place. Yeah, we looked at why he, was, uh, des why he desired to go get it, but let's see why he got it, especially when his peers were punished. And I'm going to uh, go ahead and tell you the reason why. It's because Caleb knew how to come on with the come on. Yeah, yeah, come on with the come on. Listen, listen, it's not a phrase that's currently popular. Don't worry about it. You're, this is not current slang. This is not a modern colloquialism. Uh, I first heard James Brown say it uh, in his 1974 song, My Thing. But since then, I found out that Cab Calloway recorded a song called Come On With The Come On in 1940. So you may be wondering, Huff, why would a phrase that you heard that came out in the 70s and that came out in the 40s pop in your head for this sermon? I know I know an explanation is necessary. This is for two reasons. Number one, in September of last year, uh, Ted Smooth, New York DJ, also known as the Remix King, mixed James Brown's My Thing with Rakim's Eric B for president. 
uh, Rockham and Eric B's Eric B for president. It's a great mix if you like old school hip hop. And during the mix, the DJ lets James Brown's speaking part clearly play when he says, come on with you, come on. That brought the phrase back to my memory. But the reason that I'm using it in my sermon is because number two, with all the things going on in the world and all of the believers losing their bravery and their courage to keep on keeping on, to fight in their own, uh, fight for their own future, to grid it out toward their goals, to continue on their journey toward justice, to keep on uh, stalking out their spiritual growth. As I look at all of the people getting beat up against the ropes because they can't dodge fast enough and they can't block fast enough, the only phrase I could think of to express what we must do in these days and times is if we're ever going to see any change personally or societally is the phrase that I heard this past September. Come on with the come on. Now, for those of you struggling to understand what that means, I'll make it simple. I'm going to reduce it all the way down to this simple definition. Come on with the come on means put in some effort into putting in some effort. That's it. Put in some effort into putting in some effort. The first come on is a phrasal verb. It's telling you to do something. It's an instruction. The phrase come on is encouraging you to do something greater than you already done it. Come on now. Come on and do something. You are encouraging somebody to put a little more into it. The second come on in the phrase is a noun. It describes the thing that you have to do greater, the thing in which you need to put in more effort. Effort to do what? Well, as many of you know, that all depends on the situation. Because when you use a phrase like come on with the come on, the person you are talking to has already been made aware of the thing that they need to put more effort into. It's like telling somebody, hey, go get the thing. They already know what the thing is. It's like saying, um, she was over there with all of them. You already know who all of them is. When somebody says something like, if you're going to do it, do it. You already know what doing it means. Well, now, when James Brown said it, he was misogynistically describing how a man should approach a woman to dance. When Cab Calloway said it, he said, come on, swing it uh, with the job, brother. You, you, you got to swing it with the job, brother. You got to come on with the come on. I really like the phrase partly because I'm an old soul, but the other reason is because in the instruction of come on with the come on, there's no time frame for how long you have to keep on trying. There's no set destination. There's no limit to it. It's just telling you, come on, keep on doing what you need to do. There's no goal that has been set to stop putting in effort. There's no finish line on this. Come on with the come on says, give it what you got until you're done giving it what you got. You'll know when the time comes, when it comes, but till then, come on with the come on. You may not know how long, you may not know how far, just keep on giving it what you got until you are done giving it what you got. And if I wanted to stop my sermon right here, I probably could and feel that I've done what the Lord has called me to do today because there are enough people who are here in the house and who are watching at home who need to be encouraged in the face of all of your problems and the problems of the world to come on with the come on. I know you're tired, but come on with the come on. They, they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. I, I, I know you're feeling anxiety, but come on with the come on. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I, I know you don't see the point or the destination sometimes, but come on with the come on. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge God. In your lives and your families and in your communities and in your future, commit to putting in some effort to putting in some effort. Get off the court if you're not going to play. Get out the ring if you're not going to fight. Get off the track if you're not going to run. How are we supposed to stand up for those in need if we can't even come on with the come on? How are we going to work toward justice if we don't come on with the come on? How are we going to work to prevent uh, another Tyree Nichols or another Keenan Anderson? How are we going to work to get resolution on, 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 on disturbing facts? Like between 2019 and 2021, homicides on black women went up 51%, while the unsolved homicides went up 89%. That means they were killed exponentially more and their cases were solved exponentially less than any other demographic. How are we going to address these things? How are we as believers going to use our voice and our actions to find some solutions for the insane amount of mass killings that are going on? How are we going to do that if we're not going to put in some effort to putting in some effort? Well, Caleb has an answer for us. Come on with the come on. 
There's too much for us to do. Listen, listen, lean on in. I got a story to tell. This is what's happening in the text. Some of you heard this last week. Some of you may be familiar with it. But when the Israelites escaped slavery and they crossed the Red Sea with the miraculous move of God and they enter into the wilderness trying to go to the land that God promised them, they had a destination. But when they finally got to the destination, everything went wrong. Numbers 13, Moses, the leader of the people, sent one representative from each tribe. So he sent 12 uh, scouts to go see what the land was about, who was in the land, and if it was a good place for them. And when they came back with their report 40 days later, they came back with food in their hand and fruit that they saw and talked about how great it was. They said the land was flowing with milk and honey, but the people who live there are strong. The cities have large walls, and, and, and there are even giants who live there. In verse 30, Caleb says, Caleb, one of the 12 scouts who represented Judah, says, everybody be quiet. To be crude, as everybody began to complain to Moses about the people and how big they were and how much they didn't think they could win, Caleb, to be crude, ultimately tells everybody, shut up. Listen to Moses. Let's go now and take the land. We are more than able to conquer it. But the other scouts, these cowards, not only kept complaining that they could not win, but then they lied about, it says they lied about how dangerous the land was to the other people to make them turn on Moses. They intentionally spread fear with lies and put doubts in the minds of the people. And then the people began to ask questions. They wanted to know, God, why did you bring us out here to die? Why would you bring us out of slavery just to have us die in the desert or to have us go fight this battle where our children and, and, and our wives will be taken prisoners? They said, let's pick a new leader to take us back to slavery. Yeah, 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 yeah. They said, they said listen, listen, after all the lies have been spread, after all of the, the, the mistruthing happened, they had to come to a conclusion, or they came to one that said, you know what, we've heard everything that you said, and now we're so afraid that even though we have a decent leader right now telling us what we can do, moving toward progress, you know what, let's pick a new one to take us back to oppression. Break the picture. Lies were spread. Fear was spread. And they said, you know what, we need to pick a new leader to take us backwards from where God brought us from. The people were ready to kill Moses and his brother, all because of their cowardice. And then we get to the part of the text message I read at the beginning of the sermon, and I hope you stayed with me because this is the hook. Verse 20 hops in at the end of a conversation between Moses and God. God was upset with the people, but Moses begged God that uh, they wouldn't have to suffer with all of the consequences of their distrust. God said, fine, 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 I'll forgive them. But none of the people who witnessed the miracles I did bringing them out of slavery will make it into the land that I promised them. Verse 24, but because Caleb has a different spirit, because Caleb has a different attitude and wholeheartedly followed me, I will bring him into the land that he explored and his descendants will possess it. But till then, Moses, tomorrow, turn around and take the people back into the desert and take them on the road that leads them back to the Red Sea. That's where they wanted to go anyway. Go on and take them back to where I brought them from. The people spent 40 years not being where God said that they would be, working their way closer to the oppression they left than to where they were when they gave up. An entire generation died in the wilderness because they were too scared to go get what God told them to get. But Caleb, with his different attitude and wholeheartedly following God, was allowed to get something a little extra because he knew how to come on with the come on. He would get to enter the land he scouted. He was ready for all the smoke, even though he didn't know the end. He just trusted, hey, if we came out here and God brought us this far, but well, we need to keep on fighting and keep on going. Because he had faith in how God said it would end, he was ready to set it off and trust that God would take care of the rest. 
Nobody, when they get into a fight, knows how a fight's going to go. You don't know all the swings and the moves and the dodge and everything else, but you do trust that you can win. Caleb said, look, I'm willing to start the fight because I trust that God is going to finish it for us. He was ready to put in some effort to putting in effort. So what can Caleb teach us about keeping our fire and our faith as we work to eliminate evil and the fight for our future? What does Caleb teach us about uh, being able to come on with the come on? I only got one point for you, and I'm going to sit down, and that point is we must have a different attitude. Somebody said we must have a different attitude. Somebody at home type in the chat, we must have a different attitude. Instead of attitude, though, the original text actually describes this as ruha, right? This is actually the breath of God, the spirit of God, that Caleb had a different spirit. Caleb had something different in him. But I like one translation's word of attitude here because some people, when they see that the Bible says spirit, they believe, well, that's something I can't do anything about. They hear, well, he had a different spirit. I don't have that spirit, so it must not be talking about me. I like attitude because what you see Caleb do here is actually make a choice. He chooses to step up and say that we can do what God said we can do. He had a different attitude. He had a different spirit. Now, I believe part of this is because although he represented the tribe of Judah, he wasn't really from the tribe of Judah. I know you don't really care about this. You don't really care about all the history, but he was a Kenizzite. That's a group of people that they encountered after they left slavery. It's probably a group of people that they may even have fought at some point in time, and Caleb came over to join them in their cause. So I believe part of what made Caleb different was that although he was down for the same cause, he did not think like the people who came out of Egypt. He didn't have the same PTSD they had. He didn't have those same experiences. He didn't have those same struggles. He didn't have that same uh, mentality that was bogging him down. He didn't think like slaves thought. He didn't embody their fears. He didn't worry about what they worried about. He had already been in battles. He had already probably been in some kind of war. Caleb's name means dog. Part of that is because people believe it may have been a totem of his clan, but it means dog. And when you dig a little deeper, you hear other definitions of that, like or other synonyms, that he was resolute or that he was tenacious. Caleb was the one who was going to step up and fight. He had a different attitude. He had more fire and less fear. But that attitude followed the heart of God. Where the other scouts were cowards, he was brave. And where they lied to manipulate people, he was honest. Please understand, the land was going to be a blessing to all of them. But the other scouts didn't have enough in them. They did not have enough come on with the come on in them to fight for a better life for themselves and for their families. Now, I have to stop here because it's important that I highlight how many people we have in our lives like these scouts. I need you to crop and zoom in on this. Look at the pixels and the pericope. They were too afraid to fight for what's right because they were afraid to lose what they had. They were too afraid to fight for what's right because they were too afraid to lose what they had. So instead, they lied to manipulate people and led them going back toward the oppression they left. They were so afraid for, to fight for what's right because they were afraid to lose what they had. So they lied to manipulate, and it led them going back toward the oppression they left. Why? Because of the lies people heard. The people thought that they were better off being in an oppressed system than to fight for what God told them was theirs. Because of the lies that people heard, they thought it was better to be in an oppressed system than to fight for what God told them was theirs. And we have a lot of people like that today. But with that kind of attitude, you won't have enough fight to get what God promised we can achieve in our lives and in our churches and in our families and in our communities and, yes, in our country. We won't have enough. Listen, let me be sunny day sweeping the clouds away luminously crystal clear. People who perpetuate problematic systems pull you away from the promise. I'm going to say that again. People who perpetuate problematic systems pull you away from the promise. 
Check your crew, check your family, check your coworkers, check your classmates, check your friends, check the person on the pew with you. Who's looking backwards? Don't let them influence you or have you change your spirit. The other scouts wanted what God had for them too. But instead of going for it, their fear had them manipulate people so that they could stay comfortably uncomfortable. And when you are around people like that, you may find yourself going back to wander in places you've already left. Don't let people like that change your influence. Paulo Pieri uh, uh, from Brazil, uh, historical uh, sociologist in history, he wrote the book Pedagogy of the Oppressed, talking about how oppressed people operate when they are trying to work their way out of oppression, said, although they desire authentic existence, they fear it. They are at one and the same time themselves and the oppressor whose consciousness they have internalized. Yeah, yeah, he goes off to say, plain and simple, listen, what ends up happening is usually the person who's oppressed doesn't work to be free, they work to be a better oppressor. Yeah, it's, it's the only model they know. They don't know what freedom looks like, they know what power looks like. So usually you put them in the position and now they are worse than anything that the original oppressor ever did because they have to outdo the good job that the last person did on top. They are at one and the same themselves and the oppressor whose consciousness they have internalized. They are now perpetuating the message. Now, how does that play for us even in the church? Simple. We have people of faith who are so afraid to move forward and do things that may break the norm or break the traditions, do things that may be toward God but away from what people like, that they will go out of their way to undercut and trip and make you fall. They will continue to preach problematic uh, messages. They will continue to teach treacherous teachings that destroy people's lives just so they can stay a little more comfortable, even though they want more from God. Why? Because they are at one and the same themselves and the oppressor whose consciousness they have internalized. They are one and the same, a follower who wants more of God, but at the same time, they need to hold on to a power system. They are at one and the same, the one who wants more from God, but but they have to make sure they keep on catering to somebody else who has different influence. Sometimes they want more from God, but they are hanging out with the devil too long. They have internalized. They're one and the same. Keep people like that out of your lives. Caleb stood strong with his attitude and wholeheartedly followed God. And because of that, years later, when Joshua was leading the army, Caleb was able to get what was promised him. So like Caleb, come on with the come on and embrace a new attitude. One like Caleb, the, who had the Ruhah, God's breath, that spirit, embrace the new attitude where we say, stop with all the manipulation, stop with all the complaining. We are more than able to conquer it. We are more than able to fix it, more than able to work for it, more than able to address it. We are more than able. Come on with the come on. I, I, I know we look outnumbered. But come on with the come on. I, I, I know the odds don't look great, but come on with the come on. The world needs to see some true believers doing the work. We have families in pain who need to see some true believers trying to provide. We have people who are struggling who need to see some true believers helping. Come on with the come on. I, I, I know, I know, I know. We have been let down before, but you got to come on. Channel that different attitude. Channel that different spirit. Channel that heart that says we are more than able even if we don't know how. Come on. Give it what you got until you're done giving it what you got. Put in some effort into putting in some effort. I don't know how long the fight's going to be, but come on with the come on. I don't know how long the battle will take, but come on with the come on. I don't know how long or how treacherous that battle for equality or justice or your goals or your family or your faith is going to take, but come on with the come on. And if Caleb isn't a good enough example for you, that's fine because there was another man by the name of Jesus, who showed us what come on looks like, who kept the different attitude throughout his life, who despite the hate he received and despite the fact that there were super religious people that perpetuated problematic systems, he kept on keeping on until they crucified him and thought he couldn't keep on any longer. And if y'all know this part of the story, y'all can stop me, but early Sunday morning, he proved to them that he still had something left. He proved that you can't keep a good man down. 
He got up with all power in his hands. And it's because of him that we know the power of the Spirit of God. It's because of him that we know that we can keep on. It's because of him that we can come on with the come on, pushing through the hard days and pushing through the tough times and pushing through the tears and pushing through the depressing moments. Listen, friends, family, people of God, visitors, whoever you are, come on with the come on. Everything is riding on giving it what you got until you're done giving it what you got. I know, that's not exciting, that's a hard message to learn. It's something that we have to encourage ourselves up. Sometimes we have to rile ourselves up, I should say. We have to warm up and figure out, all right, where are we gonna get this new energy from? Where are we gonna get this new, new uh, passion from? But I will tell you to take some cues uh, from your coach. I, I, I ran track in high school, and I remember my freshman year as I joined the track team, I found out that I was faster than a lot of my fellow classmates in certain races. You know, every runner doesn't run the same race. Some people are short sprinters, some people are endurance, some people are middle distance. So I was learning that process. We were going, doing a, a, a wind sprint. So we would actually start off in a slow, very, very slow walk slash jog, and then we would speed up a little bit, and then we would go into a full sprint, and we would just keep doing the laps over and over and over and over again. But we didn't know how long we were going to do it. We were just waiting on the coach to blow the whistle to tell us we could stop. He says, start running, Boop. he blows the whistle, we all start going. I'm going around the track, going around the track, going around the track. Now listen, I was a sprinter. I wasn't a 50-yard, a, 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 a 40-yard dash sprinter. I was more of a 200. So I'm going around, I, I do my little, uh, I do my little uh, tactic, which is I'm gonna go very slow on the front end, right? I'm gonna go very slow, I'm gonna I'm 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 walk almost for the first two stages. And then when I get to the last area where we're supposed to sprint, I'm going to show out. And then I'm going to take another break. And then I'm going to show out and I'm going to take another break. And that's kind of how I went around the track a few times. And I remember I passed all of the other uh, runners. I passed everybody who was there. I was doing much better than them. I felt pretty good about myself, right? Perfect. I, I was good. I was about 5'4", 98 pounds, thinking I'm doing something, right? 98 pounds. I was, I was 98 pounds. I was 98 pounds. And I'm running and I'm running. I think I'm doing all right, but I'm getting winded. I'm, I'm tired now. I'm, I'm really, really tired. I, I want to know when is the coach going to blow this whistle? How long am I going to have to keep on this pace? I beat everybody. I, I'm, I, I'm trying my best to stay in front. And while I'm running, I hear footsteps come up behind me. And now I get nervous because I'm tired. I know I don't have in me what it takes. And I look up and I see a person who's much larger than one of my classmates. And it was my coach <laughs> who just jogged straight past me, looked me in the face and just said, come on, keep on running. I turned around and I yelled to the people behind me, how long has he been running? I said, he's been running the whole time. You've lapped him a couple of times. I said, but, but now I'm tired. And he just ran past me like it was nothing. And they was like, well, it's because you burned yourself out. See, you were focused on trying to get a lot done right now. Come on. But what the coach was trying to teach you and what he just showed you and the model that you follow is you never know when that whistle's going to blow. You don't know how long this race is going to be. You don't know how long you're going to have to put in work. But you need to take the right cue and know that this race is not given to the swift. So we have to keep on following our coach, knowing I got to come on with the come on in the long run. I got to keep on pushing. I got to keep on trying, sometimes faster, sometimes slower, sometimes winded, sometimes rested. But I got to keep on running, knowing that the person who put me on this track knows exactly what I'm capable of, knows what I can do, and will encourage me every step of the way. I know it's hard for all of us, but let us remember that we have a coach in God who knows what we are capable of and expects us to keep on going. Even when you're winded, keep on going. Even when you're burned out, keep on going. Even when you thought you knew how to handle it and it messed you up, keep on going. Learn to pace yourself. It's not about how fast you do it. It's not about how much strength you give it right now. It's about continuing to give the effort you have as long as you can. 
and there's no way that this world is going to change, our lives are going to change, our goals are going to be achieved, or anything else is going to be reached if we don't know how to keep on keeping on with our passion and with our call and purpose. 